on a beautiful English autumn day when the apples are ripe. What better thing to do than make cider? Hello and welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to our garden on a beautiful day. Fiona is getting a brood coop ready for our late broody over there who hopefully will breed us up a late cockerel that will be just ready for breeding in the spring. I'm going to get on with cider making today. And cider making is a wonderful thing. When you turn this into juice, that juice won't last unless you pasteurise it or sterilise it in some way. But ferment it and it contains its own yeast to do that and it'll last almost forever and once you've got fermented cider you can turn that fermented cider into cider vinegar and use it to preserve other things it's a fantastic small holders tool so let's look at how we do that I'm a Devon boy so making ciders in my DNA when I grew up Scrumpy cider, so-called farmhouse cider, was everywhere in Devon. And I'm not talking about the, in inverted commas, scrumpy cider made by professional cider works. I'm talking about the rough as gut stuff made by farmers in Devon farmyards. And let me tell you, most of that stuff was foul. Because it was made with old windfalls with no care. What we're going to do today is discuss the four principles of getting a really good cider on the go. And those four principles are the selection and timing of apples, so what varieties, when to pick them, scratting, that's a great English word, taking a solid apple, turning it into a pulp, pressing, so taking that pulp and extracting the juice from it, and then fermenting, how to get that stuff turned from raw apple juice into cider. And for our American friends, let me just explain that in the UK, cider is always alcoholic. If it's apple juice, it's not alcoholic. If it's cider, it is alcoholic. I understand that cider and hard cider are not alcoholic and alcoholic in the States. And almost pressed apple juice um, is cider, and once that's fermented, it's hard cider. That's not the case. So when I say cider, I mean, in American parlance, hard cider. So let's look at those four parts of the process, step by step. So let's talk about types of apple, varieties of apple, and when to pick them. There's three types, roughly, of apples. There's dessert apples, cooking apples, and cider apples. And it's important to know, you can make cider out of any of them. But what's important is getting the right mix of flavours to give you a nice, tasting cider. Now a very few good quality cider apples, you only need one apple to make a really beautiful cider. Kingston Black is a variety that that's true of. And if you press Kingston Black apples, ferment that, you're going to get a cracking cider with just one variety of tree. More generally of cider apples, a mix of tannin strong ones, sweeter ones, sharper ones, gives a more rounded flavour. If you're going to use non-specific cider apples, generally a mix of sweeter dessert apples and cooking apples gives a much better tasting cider. When do you pick? When they're ripe but before they fall is the straightforward simple answer. So today we've got three varieties that are really ripe ready to pick. This one, one of our favourites, called Lord Lambourne. We've planted that probably about eight years ago. Cracking apple, beautiful to eat, nice, crisp, full of flavour, good for juicing as well. As a really juicy apple, really nice, doesn't keep worth a thing. It's, you know, probably about a month after you pick them, they're going to go over. So what we tend to do with these is eat as many as we can, fresh, peel a load and make apple rings with them and dry those apple rings and the rest go for juice and cider. This one, this little oddly shaped, slightly pear shaped, is known as Adam's Pear Mane. Brilliant juicing apple, does keep fairly well, but gives a nice, this is almost a slightly rougher, almost russety flavour. This is a much sweeter, softer apple. 
So we're going to blend the juice of those two and we're going to add this one which is called Sunset. Sunset's a dual purpose, it makes a good cooker, good eater, gives a bit more robustness to the overall cider. So those are the three apples we're going to use today. We've got a few, let's go and pick some more. Once we've gathered plenty of apples, we have to turn them into a pulp. And that's a two-step process. Rough chopping and then crushing those bigger pieces into pulp. The chap who taught me to make cider, an old guy called Bert, he's been dead for well over 30 years now, God rest him. He did it in a very simple way. A wooden half barrel and an immaculately clean garden spade. And he'd put about three layers deep of apples in and just go at it with the spade till you roughly chopped them up. We don't work on quite that scale, so I use one of these. It's a beet knife, big, heavy, designed to chop. The weight of the knife does the work, just get a decent edge on it, and that is probably the sort of size of pieces you're looking for. It's worth chopping up a decent amount of apples. You need a surprisingly large amount to make a reasonable quantity of cider. What you've then got to do when you've got your roughly chopped apples is to render those chopped apples into a pulp. Let me show you how Bert did it. It's a pickaxe handle and literally he would go into that half barrel I told you about, smash it down and reduce the chopped apples into a pulp. The reason you partly chop them first is they'll tend to roll otherwise and just roll out the way. Once they're a bit sort of roughly chopped with angles they'll stick to the floor and you can give them a good mashing. The way a lot of modern people do it is they get a clean garden shredder and again we'll just tip them from a bucket through that shredder, the sort of thing that chops branches into mulch and it will reduce that kind of apples to a pulp. What we're going to use is this beast. This beast is a hand scratter, hand cranked, and it's got a big funnel on top. You fill with these chopped apples. The funnel is removable for cleaning, and underneath that, what you can see, there's a set of teeth with hooks on. When you turn, move into themselves so they work together to grab hold of the apple pieces, suck them through the middle and crush them into a bucket that the crossbar rests on. So the arrangement is a big bucket with a scratter on, funnel above that and we turn the handle and crush the apples. This is what you end up with, small pieces of apple, small enough that a decent press can squeeze the juice out. Once the apple has become a fine pulp, you've got to squeeze the juice out of that pulp. You can't just squeeze the pulp itself, because anywhere you put pressure on it, if it's just pulp, the pulp will either shoot out the sides, or what you eventually get is some sort of liquidised mush. So you want something that applies pressure, that allows the juice out, holds the pulp in. In the old days, we used hessian for that old sacking when things came in hessian sacks, because it was cheap and available. So what you do, pop your apple there, 
wrap it up into what was called a cheese and you would stack multiple cheeses much bigger than this on top of each other in the press and squeeze them down. Hessian's not around so much anymore but I'll tell you what is onion sacks very fine meshed onion sacks absolutely brilliant things perfect for straining your apples if you're in a rural area and can get onion sacks if you can't you can buy either fine or coarse and fine is better in my opinion straining bags from homebrew type places and use those when it's time to squeeze your pulp you are going to need some sort of press there's no way around that let me show you mine and then we'll talk briefly about cheaper alternatives that you can make or get. Mine basically is almost like a steel pot with a hole in the bottom and the pulp goes in there but actually it sits inside this straining vessel which stops the pulp forcing its way out of this tube. And just to make it doubly good I put a straining bag inside that. The whole shebang sits on this little nozzle goes there and all you do is turn the screw and this plate squeezes the pulp down and the juice runs out of there. What I do to make life a little bit easier is put a bit of rubber hose on the end of that tube just so that I can direct the squeeze juice into another one of the five gallon buckets. These obviously are commercially made. You can get them, you can get much bigger ones than that. I like to say to people, you don't have to spend money to do this stuff. And I've seen some really good cider presses, either made of a big wooden screw. Now, how you get hold of a wooden screw in this day and age, that's a different matter. But I'll tell you what I have seen that work really brilliantly well. It's made out of car jacks. With kind permission from Alf Webb, here's a picture of just such a homemade cider press. Simple frame, made out of RSJ with a bottle jack pressing down on several stacked cheeses of apple pulp and the stacked cheeses are wrapped in net curtains he tells me the juice runs out into the wooden box at the bottom at the bottom left hand corner of that box there's a pipe leading out to a funnel and a jerry can every bit as effective as my bought cider press for almost no money and cider has always been a drink made by people for themselves in simple ways. And it's all the better for that. Home pressed apple juice will ferment into cider quite happily with natural yeast. It doesn't hurt though to give it a teaspoon of general purpose yeast to help that process along. Entirely up to you, I wouldn't rush out and buy it, but I buy general purpose yeast by the tub. And what that does is ensure it gets off to a good quick ferment. You'll notice that I've left what's called a lot of head space at the top of the demijohn. That's because this is going to foam quite violently in its primary fermentation. You can, if you choose, do the first two or three days of fermentation in a clean fermenting bucket with a cover. But if you leave plenty of gap in your demijohn and then top it up when that violent fermentation has finished, that works absolutely fine as well. In about three weeks, that'll be fully fermented out. Don't forget, leave decent headspace so that when it foams initially, it's got somewhere to go without foaming through the airlock. 
optional teaspoon of yeast, but really you don't need it for cider. In three weeks time, as I say, that's going to be a fantastic still cider. If we want a sparkling cider, we'll bottle it with half a teaspoon of sugar per litre. That'll create a sparkling cider. The still stuff we can use in our homemade cider vinegar, and that is both delicious and saves us so much money in the rest of the preserving we do. We'd love to show you more of this sort of self-reliant, self-sufficiency, home production type of stuff if it's of interest to you. And if it is, please click the subscribe button down below. Click the notifications little bell next to it and you'll hear every time we upload a new video. If you've enjoyed today's, could you spare five seconds just for a thumbs up? And if you could, find the time to leave us a comment. That makes such a difference to the channel. Whatever you do, come back and see us soon. Take care. Bert, who's been a long dead man, and Fiona's jiggling in the background, ruining the shot. So I'm going to have to do a retake of this. Do excuse me, and please mail your complaints to at the floof lady on Twitter.